Hi, I'm Emily Hazard. And I'm Becca Anderson. And this is Grey's Anatomy Uncut, a podcast where we discuss and analyze episodes of Grey's Anatomy. Today we are talking about Season 2, Episode 23, Blues for Sister Someone, which was originally sung by Lenny Kravitz, my boy Senna. Original air date is April 30th, 2006, written by Elizabeth Claviter, directed by Jeffrey Melman. 20.76 20.76 million viewers, which is down from last week. How is it down? <laughs> I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, last week was such a good episode. There wasn't also, any- like, how is 20 million viewers down from last week? You know what I mean? Like, 20 million viewers is almost mm-hmm. unattainable now. Yeah. So we've been gone for a really long time. I had a, a charming little stomach flu and... uh a nice little vacation. A charming stomach... F- That's not how I would explain it. Stomach flu. How would you explain vomiting ten times <laughs> in an hour? <laughs> Disgusting. In an Airbnb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I puked my guts out in an Airbnb. I feel sorry for those people that had to come in. And, <laughs> and obviously I did not want to record with her. Yeah, very true. And, uh, Anytime after that. And that's pretty much all that's uh, been been going on with us. That's our, that's your update. Also, um, I'd like to give a shout out to some of the fans that have contacted us. I mean, that is like the coolest thing. Like, mm-hmm. I, I mean, Becca and I started this podcast for us, <laughs> but... Well, you Not know, to be selfish, but... We start, yeah, we started this for us, bitch. No, we started this podcast for ourselves, but, like, I think it reached kind of a new level when we realized that, oh my god, people are actually listening to it, and so that's a really big deal, and I just wanted to say thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, how about you do your opening statement? All right. Uh, this episode is a winner. Somehow the writers managed to do even better than last episode. We get... Some really great scenes with George and Izzy. We get more people missing the signs of the inappropriate relationship between Izzy and Denny. and Or maybe not just missing the signs, but just choosing to ignore the signs. Mm-hmm. And we get a huge moment when Derek discovers Meredith with Finn. As, coincidentally, Doc is getting sick. Mm-hmm. Coincidence? Metaphors. I think not. Overall, a great episode, but like... It just, it keeps getting better from here. Which is still unbelievable. We're still climbing that mountain to the amazingness that is the season finale. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, there's a ton of things I could say about this episode. I'm just going to focus on the character building. I think that that is what makes Grey's Anatomy so special. And kind of like TV, just in general, because you get to spend so much time with the characters as opposed to movies, you know? But if I could nail down one thing that I think makes this episode special, it's that the writers are still trying at every turn in the road to grow their characters and to flush them out. Like, we learn a lot about Burke and a lot about Christina, not so much just about their past, but just, like, how they would react to a certain situation, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, We kind of take it for granted later. We know Christina as the kind of person that would do X, Y, or Z. We know that Izzy would do X, Y in this situation. But the reason we know that is because of episodes like this. Mm -hmm. And I really like how they took their time flushing out their characters. You know, it's not like they try to, like, push them in and immediately, like, make them main characters and immediately try to exposition all their back story, you know? They're showing, not telling. Yeah, but it's not even just that. They're showing very slowly. Just like you would get to know an actual person in actual real life. It's not just, like, showing vomit in, like, the first episode. Like, they're just like, this is all of their character traits. <laughs> like, we're oh, vomit. I was like, like, Meredith did throw up in the first episode, so. Oh, she did. Yeah, remember when she threw up on that tree? <laughs> did you throw up on a tree? No, I threw up in a toilet. <laughs> hmm. So considerate of you. I also threw up in a pot. (laughs) (laughs) Seriously. I'm going to take away the considerate part now. (laughs) I was like, oh, I don't feel so good. I'm going to go get a pot just in case I throw up. Well, I guess we kind of do that too because like 
if you're like the stomach flu or something, I'm like laying on the couch. Like my dad gets like a bucket for me just in case. Yeah, and then I'm like, I'm gonna go get a pot. And then I, I sorry like, guys, I stood up and I got a pot and I was like, oh my god. <laughs> and then I threw up in the pot on the way to the bathroom. I was just like walking casually with my pot. <laughs> Anyway. <laughs> okay. So, opening speech. The key to being a successful intern is what we give up. Sleep, friends, and a normal life. We sacrifice it all for the one amazing moment. That moment when you can legally call yourself a surgeon. There are days that make the sacrifices seem worthwhile. And then there are days where everything feels like a sacrifice. And then there are the sacrifices that you can't even figure out why you're making. Love by the Sunshine is the first song playing here. And unfortunately, we open up with George and Callie in Callie's sex dungeon. And as the name would imply, they did just have sex here. And also her thing. She's like, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Who does that? I was really glad that I didn't watch this while I had the stomach flu because I want to throw up right now. Like, I just, just the way she says that, like, thank I know, you. I'm like, ew. Isn't that kind of what you say to, like, prostitutes or something? Like, not that I know. <laughs> not that I have experience. What? <laughs> anyway. Okay. Um, yeah, so we've been put on this roller coaster ride, and we are not allowed to get off, no matter how much we beg. And I just, I would love to... Just dive into the psyche of a Callie George shipper. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'd like to meet one. Because I, I, as I've said before, I ship George in the stairs before I just ship uh, George and Callie. <laughs> uh, do you have anything else you want to say about this opening scene that is... Not particularly. Moving on. So then we go over to Derek and Addison's trailer. Yeah, and thankfully Derek calls her out on her, like, being like, thanks, because that's weird. <laughs> no, but the way she said it was kind of, like, funny, because she was like, thanks, like that. And I was just like, Addison. And I, this, it just, I find it so amusing, because in this scene, they're like, man, I can't believe we don't have chemistry anymore. But they say that with great chemistry you know what i mean like and this will not be the last time this show tries to do that like they'll have two characters look at each other and just be like we don't really have chemistry but they say it and their eyes are like burning at each other and they're like they say it with so much chemistry that i think it's like ironic like i'm not buying it you guys have so much chemistry mm -hmm. yeah so then the phone rings and derek's talking and he's like oh it's the vet and then Addison, like, grabs the phone from him and just goes, we're going to have to call you back. We're trying really hard to have some decent sex here. And then it's foot, like, switches to Meredith on the phone. Which, like, that's a weird thing to say to anyone on your phone. Also, in your fucking face, Meredith. <laughs> and she's like, come on, what's so funny? It's like, even if that was Dr. Dandruff. That'd it, be freaking weird. That'd be weird. I, by the way, I have to. His name has to be Dr. Dandruff, right? <laughs> like, it's sitting right there. Or it's Dr. Doolittle. I like Dandruff. <laughs> so Doc Dandruff here is like, everything okay? And Meredith is like, yeah, everything's great. And then she turns to Doc and she's like, you look good. He looks good. Finn is like, yeah, it might be a virus. Whatever. Point is, Doc is still sick. And Finn then awkwardly asks Meredith out, which I don't know if it's awkward on his part, but it certainly is on Meredith's part because we get one of her worst rambles in the entire show. <laughs> yeah. I just want to read Meredith's little ramble thing. You you be Finn. So, you and Derek, uh, you're together? Uh, uh, Derek and I are, um, just friends. He's married and I'm knitting a sweater and, uh, well... I guess I'm rambling, which I tend to do a lot of lately, and I wish somebody would just tell me to shut up. But my point is, yeah, yeah, we're, uh, he's married and I'm knitting a sweater. That's how she delivered it, too. Yeah, which is like... And he's like, uh, so you're single. And she's like, single. Like that. <laughs> yeah, like, 
And it's just like really weird. And because she's like, I, he's like asked her out and she's like out with you. And he's like on a date tonight. And she's date like tonight. Like that. And <laughs> she pulls a deer date tonight. Yeah. Like it's so weird. Like Meredith, I know you're knitting a sweater, but like stop acting weird. You can still have normal social situations and be knitting your sweater. But do you think that she has chemistry with this man, Dr. Dandruff? A little bit. Like, as awkward as that scene was, it was kind of like, oh, he makes her nervous. Mm -hmm. Or she makes herself nervous because she knows that you put a nymphomaniac in a room with that man and things just go badly. Meredith with any man. Mm -hmm. So true. And Meredith with somebody that has a pulse. So then we <laughs> cut over to Bailey, who still has a ginormous stick up her ass because the chief is just like, I don't know. Like, this is the kind of Bailey that kind of annoys me. She's just like, another day. And once again, I don't see my name on the board, chief. That seems immature. It seems below her. Like, normally she would just go to his office and say, can we have a conversation about this? Yeah. You know, it's like when she acts like this, it's almost like the chief has the upper hand here when he really shouldn't. Yeah. Well, and then I feel like what makes it worse is then he like walks away and she's like, like, Burke is like, oh, you think he's mommy tracking you? And she's like, what, what have you heard? And it's like, it's like, oh my God, I don't care. And like the other Bailey would be like, shut up, stop gossiping in my, in my like hospital. Exactly. Just stick with it, guys. I yeah. promise. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so she gets to handle Denny for today, and she walks off, and <laughs> this is such a great scene. Yes, Christina comes off, and she's like, oh, Burke, like, I bought you, brought you coffee. Is this the same nurse's station where he bought her coffee in season one and then was super awkward, and he's like, it's just coffee, and she was like, good. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> but I just love, like, because she's like, like, this is super nice for Christina, like, bringing him coffee mm -hmm. or whatever, and then Burke's like, oh, He's like, oh, thanks. Yeah, very thoughtful. He says it just like that. And she's like, what? <laughs> she's like, I am dragging. I only did two miles this morning. <laughs> He's missing his bro. His bromance. Like, his bro crush. Mm -hmm. So much. Yeah. And she's like, oh, you're missing George. And he's like, of course not. And then George walks up. He's like, cappuccino. And they have this whole, like, bro whatever thing. Like, they do moment. this weird, like, bro, like, chest bump. Like, they're like, let's make him touch. But he doesn't. He's like, I brought you a cappuccino, bro. And they're like, yeah, man. Like, Again, it's so, so weird. what's your coffee order? Like, just drip coffee? Yeah. Yeah, I just, I don't understand the whole cappuccino thing. Like, if I had to guess. I've never had a cappuccino. If I had to guess, I would say that Burke is more of a, like a, an Americano type guy. I don't know. I've never had a cappuccino. Like, okay, so. Derek is totally a latte guy, you know, like all milk and no substance, but like he needs his like fancy little like Starbucks drink. Like. Yeah, with his little swirl on top. That's <laughs> totally, that's totally me. Yeah, but Burke always strikes me as Americano. I mean, George could be a cappuccino because I feel like Izzy is also a cappuccino. A cappuccino is an espresso based coffee drink that originated in Italy and is traditionally prepared with double espresso and steamed milk foam. Mm -hmm. So it's espresso with foam milk, basically. And, and a latte is basically all milk and just like a little bit of coffee. Espresso? No. No. Lots well, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, they're all espresso drinks. Like Americano's espresso. Like, And then I feel like Bailey's just like straight up like shot of espresso. <laughs> just kick or it like back. Or like straight black coffee, like super strong. Yeah. Yeah. The chief would be like a skinny girl like latte. <laughs> like some random. Yeah. Be, who and Christina's a mocha latte. Which okay. Whatever. Meredith has to be like the strongest, like bitterest coffee. <laughs> yeah, she's just like dark and twisty. I bet Meredith just chews the beans. <laughs> Meredith, what are you eating there? Espresso beans. And then Dr. Dandruff is like, holy shit. So anyway, George is like, big news, Eugene Foote is here. Which, how did they come up with that name? <laughs> and he goes, Eugene Foote is here. What? In this hospital? And then... And Christina is just like, what the hell is happening? Yeah. Like, because I... And I, I love this dynamic because George is clearly the better boyfriend to Burke than Christina is a girlfriend. It's, it's just hilarious because, like, George knows so much more about him. And then he's just like... Burke has, like, 40 of his albums. And I'm like, oh my god, did you listen to 40 of these terrible albums? You probably counted. 
Yeah, and then Burke goes 42, and then George, actually 43, you got his greatest hits, the one with the DVD. Really, what I wanted him to say there, like, you know, the one with the DVD that we watched together, <laughs> like, like, on our little, like, bro date. <laughs> yeah. And then he watches George leave, like, man, I would love to spend a good seven minutes in a closet with you. <laughs> and Christina's just like, hello, I want in. And Burke's like, oh, yeah, sure. Burke, I, um, I laid on top of you naked last night, so why don't you wax nostalgic about that? <laughs> and he's just like, does not compute. He's like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sorry, sorry, I was drinking my cappuccino. <laughs> and then Meredith is pulling a classic Meredith and she's talking about herself to Alex and she goes obviously I can't go out with him right and Alex is like I don't care (laughs) yeah and so does the whole audience really and Meredith goes I don't want to do him date him I'm not doing anybody I'm knitting that's I just I can't tell you why but the way Ellen delivers lines just will always fascinate and just bring joy to my life. Mm-hmm. It's weird, right? I mean, he, he's Derek's vet. He's Doc's vet. He's my vet. He's McVet. It's weird to date him, right? Wait, did you say vet? Mm-hmm. Like animals? Oh, you can't date a, date a vet. He's not even a real doctor. And as ridiculous as this line is, I think that this like kind of logic actually works on Meredith. Because in some weird way, Meredith is like, wait, maybe she's right. <laughs> It's because they're, like, the Twisted Sisters, so, you know. Yeah, exactly. But, like, and then Addison walks up, and she's, like, talking to herself like a crazy person. And Meredith is, like, must not have gone so well this morning. Meredith is just, like, relishing in this. Yeah. She's, like, yes. She's, like, watching. Exactly. She's watching, like, the world burn down, and she's loving it. Yeah. So then Alex gets on Addison's case. And thus begins, like, Addison, you think that maybe her... Her whole point in this show is to just break up Meredith and Derek, and this right here proves that she's way more than that. And I can't say anything more, but eventually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So now we finally get some Denny, because we always need some Denny in our lives. Retweet. And it's super interesting, because we get Bailey and Meredith on him today. Mm-hmm. Changing which, it up. Which, like, originally when they first introduced him... Bailey was there, mm-hmm. but I don't think Meredith has really ever been there. Well, she was there in that scene, but she w- she hasn't been, like, the yeah. primary... It's been, like, Izzy and Alex. Yeah. Which is interesting. I like this little, like, dynamic. Denny can actually charm Bailey, too, which is impressive. Mm-hmm. And then Izzy just kind of barges in, like, like a wife would, and be like, mm-hmm. I told him he's not ready for that, and do all this stuff. And you kind of are like, this is super awkward. But, okay, so it's super awkward. Because Bailey is not really being Bailey and stopping this. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? But then you're also like, oh, Denny. Because he's like, you're not the boss of me today, woman. And the show keeps it light. So you're like, oh, okay. Well, maybe this isn't bad. Mm-hmm. But you also totally see, because I do a couple of cuts of Meredith's face mm-hmm. doing this. And Meredith is totally picking up on this. Oh, yeah. Hashtag vibes. She's picking up on those vibes. Mm-hmm. Which is interesting. So let's go over to Alex and Addison's patient, who is a jerk. This woman, like, I'm not trying to say anything bad against, like, super religious people and, like, super people who are against, like, birth control and all this stuff, but this lady, like, pisses me off. And not mostly because of this scene, because of what happens later, Mm. which we'll get to. But I do like how they have Addison being, like, offering the sympathy, and then they have almost her foil of Alex. Yeah. Who is playing devil's advocate. So whoever watches this scene feels like they have representation on both sides of the issue. You know what I'm saying? Mm Mm-hmm. Because Alex is like, you don't need our help. Your husband's not abusing you, and you don't get to lie to him and blame it on the Pope. Which, like, he makes a fair point. Like, I mean, like, as brutal, as, like, blunt as it is, like... But then Addison tears Alex Ten new assholes when <laughs> when they come out of this room, and I love it. But then he kind of, like, gets her a little bit back, too, because she's like, do you understand? Like, understood? And he's like, oh, are you, are you giving me permission yeah. now? Oh, are you giving me permission now? And she, like, the look that the two of them are giving each other is like, oh, it's on. This is kind of <laughs> hot, though, right? Like, I feel like they kind of, like, both mutually want to bang each other. They have, like, they have a good chemistry. Yeah. Which is fantastic. 
Anyway. I feel like this is one of those cases where the showrunners were kind of like, you know how, like, they test out chemistry between different people a lot, and they see, like, oh, let's see what happens when we put these two together on a case just to see what the chemistry happens to have, and they have it. Like, the best example of this I can think of was Andy and April from Parks and Rec, where they were just like, let's just try it. Let's put them together for an episode. And then that just... They had so much chemistry together that it spun off into ways that they never saw coming, Mm -hmm. you know? Interesting pairing. Mm -hmm. So then we get Derek, George, and Izzy with... Yes. This lady who, like, honest to God, becomes one of... Is, like, one of my favorite people. Yeah, like, when we rank the patients in season two, she... if, If she's not an honorable mention... You know what I mean? If she's not in my top list, she's definitely going to be an honorable mention. Oh my gosh, yes. She's great. <laughs> Fantastic. And I love this little line, like, where she's like, unless any of you are looking to get out of a bad marriage. And, like, George and Izzy are like, no. And they kind of both, like... Look at Derek. <laughs> look at Derek a little bit, and then, like, have this face. And because, well, and, like, George and Izzy, like, say no right away, and he doesn't say anything. And then he's like, yes, no, I'm, I'm fine, thank you. Really? Yes. Because I'm an excellent divorce attorney. I'm sure you are. And there was a look between these two. And then Derek is like, how dare you? <laughs> like he Derek looks, like, looks at them like, I'm going to rip your heads off. He's like, I gave you breakfast advice back in season one. And then she goes, what is it? You married young and now you have nothing in common. Oh, no, don't tell me. I know. The conversation is still good, but the sex has gone to pot. And Nailed I was it. like, yeah. Although, is their conversation still good? I don't even know. <laughs> no. Their chemistry together is good. Yeah, well, <laughs> thank you, Patrick and Kate. But, yeah. And I just love this little line from Derek. Use a strobe light. Get her drunk. Hang her from the ceiling upside down and hit her with a wiff- wiffle ball bat for all I care, okay? Just make her seize. <laughs> because until she seizes, I don't know where to operate. And if I don't know where to operate, I can't get this woman out of my life. And this woman is not how I like to start my mornings. Which, like, this woman is how I would want to start my mornings. Because she's every hilarious. Morning. I know. This is this woman is how I'd like to start my mornings and in every one of my days. And Izzy just kind of, like, laughs straight at him. <laughs> oh, like, and they're so cute. And now we cut over to this scene of Izzy literally just trying to, like, pee, like, claw information out of George (laughs) and he is just not having it but can we talk about how the dynamic has shifted from where it was even half a season ago between Izzy and George Mm -hmm. it's very much more I feel like it was the bomb that cemented their friendship oh yeah like the little moments they had about like we have to become doers Mm -hmm. that whole thing like that was like okay Izzy and George are like officially BFFs but like this, in a way, is proving to the audience that it's like, whoa, like, Izzy really cares about him. Because you know she wouldn't yeah. do this for any other person. Oh, yeah. Like, if Meredith did this, no. Yeah, Christina, she really not care. even close. Alex, like, she would have, like, packed his bags for her for him and, like, kicked him out of the house. Yeah, but George is special to her. And that's oh, yeah. really important to note. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just love this. I'm just curious, George. <laughs> curious George! Get it? <laughs> like... That is hilarious. That goes in my um, Izzy Stevens the, funny moments. The way she says it. And then they're like having this whole like thing. I'm busy doctoring to Dr. Stevens. And then Callie enters and you're like, ugh. And you're like, ugh. Callie and her wet, wet hair. Nobody wants horrid. this. And they start like whispering so weirdly. Like they're like. Yeah. And then they're just like, laughing. Ugh. And Catherine Heigl does the mega eye roll of the century like i swear she's probably (laughs) looking at her brain (laughs) and like the bitchiest face too of just like i couldn't care less she's just like i hate you more than i hate the shit that i just took in the bathroom (laughs) that's what she looks like (laughs) how's all that doctoring going on dr o'malley that line was so amazing uh now she's so like petty and i love it i know okay because that's how people are and that's why i like it is that they just kind of like dive into like the human psyche it's like you know that what she's doing is objectively bitchy but that's how people are so then we move over to eugene foot how did they come up with that name (laughs) this man too he like plays the violin and it (laughs) And we're all just sitting there like, snooze. No, I was sitting there being like, this is so fake. Yeah, I know. He's just like moving his hand and- So fake. 
like I played an I played an instrument for twelve years. You beatboxed in the flute. <laughs> I should have. That's my next musical. <laughs> But, like, it's so fake, and it's so bad, and it bothers you. And they're like, you played so beautifully. And I'm like, none of that even came close to what the music was playing. But yeah. whatever. He's just, like, moving his hand, and the music is, like, completely different. <laughs> He's like Freaky Friday, the girl from Freaky Friday, who's just, like, going back and forth strumming. <laughs> That's him. And he goes, too good a man to lie. And I was just like, Burke is like, I mustn't tell a lie. I am too honorable. <laughs> I like that his rhythm is off. This man has no business calling himself Eugene Foote. No, he doesn't, because that is a <laughs> ridiculous name. What the fuck? Eugene Foote. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then he goes on and on about how he picked up a violin when he was six, and then he was like, he fell in love with it. And... Oh, I kind of liked that. Oh, you liked that little speech? It was nice. Like, I don't know. Like, just how you have this moment in your life that, like... Changes the direction of your life forever? Or not even, like, changes the direction, but just makes you realize, like, this is what I want to do. Or, like, this like, is why I was put on Earth. I don't even... But, like, this moment of, like, even when you're, like, doing something and you're like, wow, that felt really good. Like, like when... Sometimes, like, did you not have, like, a run or something where you were running and it was like, wow, like, I am in love with this and this is like no i did amazing you know like yeah and so it's like i don't know it's kind of cool of just like having this moment of where you're like wow i found a passion yeah yeah but anyway <laughs> and then burke is like he cannot play like eugene foot and this uh this christina oh, line yes this is the line i was talking about when i was in my opening statement um and burke because burke is like i might let him go somewhere else and christina goes Okay, what if it were you? What if you couldn't be a surgeon anymore? Or or you could still be one, but but not a great one. Just average. He can get his surgery somewhere else, but that surgeon might be average. And I love this, because even though she doesn't know, like, she didn't know Eugene Foote, and she, like, didn't get the whole, like, he can't play before, but I feel like she realized, like, when his, in his speech, mm -hmm. the passion that Eugene Foote has for the violin is the same kind of passion that Burke has mm -hmm. for surgery, and then, like, and she kind of used that in being, like, what if you were in this situation, and you, like, all of this stuff, and you're kind of, like, using his passion. I just find to, it, like, I don't know. Utterly astounding that one the writers can have Christina turn on a dime like that, but Sandra O, oh, she, she can she can go from job. being cynical and just kind of like what he can't play anymore or something like that in the same scene and then deliver a speech like that and it doesn't seem weird. Well, and the best part is is there was a beginning part of that line where she was kind of being like, like oh you can't let him go somewhere else mm -hmm. and then she kind of notices his face and is like and knows exactly what like to say. and just like flips the switch and is like this is what i'm saying when i great. say that christina and burke just they understand each other in a way that i don't think anyone else has ever understood those two i it's will like, forever defend them well it's like they have the kind of relationship where it's like you know she might not know like his favorite color or his coffee order, mm -hmm. or, like, you know, like, that kind of, like, trivial stuff, but she, like, understands his passion, he understands, like, what, what drives him, like, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff, which you're, like, in the long run, I feel like she gets the deeper stuff about Burke. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly, and it's, like, and that's kind of what this whole episode is calling into question, it's, like, how important is that trivial stuff if you know the deeper stuff, mm -hmm. if you understand somebody on, like, almost a spiritual level, you know, and mm -hmm. and you accept them on that level as well. That's exactly. why I love them. Mm -hmm. So then we cut back to Denny. Yay. And so basically, like, Meredith and Bailey are saying, okay, we can put in this. It's the Elvad, correct? Yes. He, he makes a mistake. He goes, well, Izzy gave me medical advice. You're giving me different advice. It just so happens that your is the advice I want to hear. And Meredith is, like, so trying to, like, mop up the mess that he just made all yeah. over the floor. Meredith is like, her eyes say, I will kill you. Like, she's like from the office. You know, she's like, well, Dr. Bailey outranks Dr. Stevens. You know, your doctor, you're not supposed to be calling by mm -hmm. first Like, so it's safe to say Dr. Bailey's advice is the one to follow. And she's, like, looking at him like, I'm going to stare daggers into your heart and she's murder like, you. She's like, shut up, shut up, you son of a bitch. 
And Bailey is just like, I read through that whole thing. I know exactly what he's thinking. Yeah. But she doesn't do anything. She, she yells at Denny, but she doesn't do anything about Izzy. Mm-hmm. Take note of that. Well, and I think, because then she talks to Meredith about it later, and I think what you're kind of supposed to be getting at is, you don't get it as much in this scene, but we kind of get it later, is that she notices this, mm-hmm. but I think you're supposed to get the fact that she's not questioning it and, like, bringing this up and doing all this stuff because she is slightly doubting herself Mm -hmm. because the chief is mommy tracking her. And I think that's the point that they're trying to kind of get Mm -hmm. with this. And you slightly see it in this episode and a little bit later in the episode with some of the scenes, but it's going to come up more. I know. And it's so subtle that it's brilliant. Well, that's the amazing thing is they start bringing up the whole mommy tracking thing. And like, even us who like, we know what's going to happen. We're like, oh, we hate this. Like, it's just so annoying. But it's like, but there is a purpose and it gets to that purpose. And And you know what's great is that the purpose of it isn't fully flushed out until season three. Mm -hmm. Until there's a moment in, in early season three where you're like, oh... Yeah. You started this six to seven episodes earlier, you know, mm-hmm. maybe even eight episodes earlier so that she could say it in this scene. And I was like, God, I love this show. Mm-hmm. Do you want to do this dialogue at the end? Yeah. So basically, Bailey's asking Meredith what's going on between Izzy and Denny. And Bailey's like, uh-huh. I couldn't imagine you and Yang would be stupid enough to fall for your attendings, but I was wrong about that, wasn't I? I'm knitting these days. <laughs> Plus... I'm thinking about maybe accepting a date with a veterinarian. Gray, do you actually believe I care? No. Good. Maybe you're not so stupid after all. That's hilarious. Meredith's face is like... I I love because, like, in that scene, when that happens, you're like, old Bailey's back, she's going to destroy Izzy, like, in a second. Like, you know what I mean, though? Because she's kind of like, mm-hmm, like, Mm -hmm. there's something going on here. But then she doesn't, and you're like, ugh. Well, and it's also, like, I like how Grey's Anatomy, the television show, turned that scene from, like, what's going on between Stevens and Denny? Is it a crush? Like, that's very serious. That's what we've been talking about for episodes. And then Meredith is like, I'm also thinking about accepting a date with a veterinarian, Dr. Dandruff. And Bailey's just like, what? And she's just like, this bitch. This one right here. So then we do cut over to Izzy, who is with George, wheeling a TV into their patient's face. (laughs) So, like, so close. Yeah. I love this woman. (laughs) I think she needs her own show. Like, I would watch a Grey's Anatomy spinoff about her. I would. Like, her in her courtroom. Like, this woman. Normally, I don't have time to watch TV, but this week, I discovered Oprah. It's like, how did you just discover Oprah? (laughs) She's famous in my business for never marrying that boyfriend of hers. Wise, wise woman. (laughs) This woman is hilarious. I love her so much. And then Izzy is still trying to, like, claw information out of George. Well, okay, so we're starting to get some more of Izzy feeling left out of this relationship with George because he's with Callie. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is why I'm glad they added Callie into Grey's. Mm Mm-hmm. Nothing else. She for, <laughs> she is fulfilling a plot device right now that is so necessary mm-hmm. for our main characters. <laughs> I mean, maybe the audience didn't notice it when she first showed up, but Callie's main purpose on this show is to put pressure on Izzy and George's relationship slash friendship. Mm-hmm. And her more superficial purpose is to help George move on from Meredith. But yes. the deep, the very deep, long-lasting, like, last for seasons purpose of her character is to just apply pressure to George and Izzy. I just like that. Okay, now you're lying. To my face. <laughs> you're being paranoid. <laughs> well, I'm not seizing, but I am having an acid flashback. Does that count? It's a woman. I love her. Okay, so this actress is Jane Brooke and went on to have non-main character roles in a lot of uh, TV shows. Like, she played a doctor in private practice, which is kind of bothering to me. Like, did you know what I mean? Like, because private practice exists in the same... Oh, because it's like the spinoff. Yeah, it Addison. exists in the oh, yeah. same reality yeah, as Grey's Anatomy. So did she just, like, go to medical school and then come <laughs> back? I could totally see her doing that. She's like, I'm a doctor now. She, like, walks in and is in doors. are like... Wait. I'm the divorce doctor. 
Yeah. Um, she was in Boston Legal, Brothers and Sisters, and one episode of Revenge. Hmm, fun. <laughs> she brings so much to the Izzy George friendship. Yes. Like this, she would be the better version of Callie. <laughs> Everyone is the better version of Callie. But anyway. But no, but you know what's funny and you know what's not a coincidence is that Izzy and George are fighting constantly in the presence of a divorce attorney. Oh, yeah. They're... 100% kind of implying that, like, George and Izzy have that, like, married, married couple, yeah. like, relationship. Mm-hmm. So now we cut over to Addison and Alex and the stupid patient. It kind of feels like Addison and Alex have both met their match. Oh, yeah. And they, like, both of them don't know. Like, it's like, whatever Addison is doing, Alex can almost disarm her. But for the first time, I think Alex is like, really met his match in a woman. It's important that Alex is being put in his place by a woman. Mm-hmm. I like that. They're so great. And, I mean, this is a minor spoiler, but they really do grow into something that I really love. They, ha- they, they grow into this relationship that is such an interesting dynamic. But that's all I can say. And Rose, the patient, so annoying. The reason we haven't had a baby in four years is because we abstained for three. Now can you imagine not being able to make love to your husband? Like, ugh. And Addison's like, I don't have to imagine it, sister. My husband is in love with an intern mistress. <laughs> Which later is also, real question, can they not use condoms? I don't think so. Because oh. that counts as birth control. Okay. Contraceptive. I don't... I don't... Well, it, it is a contraceptive. Yeah. I just didn't know if that was, like, frowned upon. <sighs> Or what about, like, an IUD? Like, that, no, that's definitely a Well, no, I know, no. but she's like, because Addison's like, oh, the pill, and, he, and she's like, I can't hide the pill, he would find out. He wouldn't find out about an I IUD. I think they mean the medical thing behind it. Like, he would, he does their, their finances, and if you get an IUD, it's not, it's not that's free. Fair. It's not IU free. Anyway. So now we get a lunch scene, and I really, I kind of like that we're getting out of the cafeteria now. We've been finding some really interesting lunch spots, and it, it, it's I great. also love that they've been having lunch scenes in, like, every episode now, because these yes. lunch scenes are fantastic. The lunch scenes, I, I think you could, I would like to see a compilation video of every lunch scene in Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> I think it would be fascinating. <laughs> And also, is this lunch? I mean, Meredith is eating, like, strawberry ice cream, and I hope that they did strawberry on purpose. Christina is eating chips is or something. Because in season three, they talk about how it's her favorite. Okay, anyway. And then Izzy's just like, for the record, I'm on your side today. George sucks. I think Christina, hmm, Burke doesn't think so. He's his new best friend. <laughs> I wonder if Burke knows where he lives. Can you imagine that conversation between Izzy and Burke? Um, so where does George live? And he's just like, I cannot lie. He's and then just, just like, runs what? away. <laughs> and then Meredith, about that. I thought Alex was kidding when he said you dumped him for a heart patient. Did you really dump him for a heart patient? And then Izzy's like, of course not. <laughs> like, she's just so dismissive of Meredith. And Meredith is like, I deserve that. And Meredith is like, uh, we can't fall for your patients. Like, no doubt, Meredith. And then Christina, you're falling for a vet. <laughs> Which I love how Christina thinks that dating a vet is worse than dating a patient. Yeah, I know. Like, like Meredith dating a vet is like is like the equivalent of her dating like a garbage person to Christina. <laughs> I'm considering the possibility of maybe having a date with a vet. That's all I'm saying. And Meredith is like, wait, what? <laughs> but again, we have, because Meredith totally sees that relationship, but then Christina completely like steers her off of it. It's like they, well, I say this like it surprises me. It's like they don't care about anybody but themselves. Which, and I feel like that's the only way that this could work. Yeah, so Meredith basically is just like, be careful, Izzy. Which, like, she has already passed the line on careful. Oh, yeah. She already, like, made out with him. <laughs> okay. But here's a, a, an interesting ethical question as we go back to Alex and Addison. If you were in this situation, if your boss was clearly doing something to cross the line, even if it was for the pa- like what the patient wants, would you go along with it because your boss, because they're your boss and they have the power, you know, to advance your career? And technically, you wouldn't really take the blame because it's your boss. Yeah, you'd be like, "Look, I was following orders." You know what I mean? Like, you might get like a little slap on the wrist, but you wouldn't like. I don't know. Because what they do with this storyline and what Grey's does with so many other storylines is do the, like, conflict between, like, what is morally, like, 
ethically, like, correct. Mm-hmm. And, like, but doing something that, like, you know, like, is good. Because it's, like, yes, ethically, like, she should not be doing this surgery at all. Because, like, it's against the law, like, whatever. I don't know if it's against the law. But, like, I think it's against the law because she's not, like... She's not recording it, yeah, basically. or whatever. Um, they have a case. Yeah. But it's what her patient wants. Mm-hmm. And so I like... Because they do this with a ton of other cases, too. It's kind of like, where is that line between, like, crossing the line of, like, you're going into, like, all right, that's not okay, even though it's what your patient wants, and, like, kind of, where is that line? Mm-hmm. It makes me wonder, though, like, could Alex be so opposed to this? I mean, Alex has his own moral compass, which is often a little dark and twisted, but he has a very mm-hmm. strong moral compass. But could he be opposed to this? Because now he sees this attending who he's supposed to look up to and, you know, model himself off of, kind of playing with that same ethical line as Izzy is, and maybe that's why it gets under his skin even more. Mm-hmm. See, that's, I can't tell if he's more upset with the fact that she's crossing a line or that he's just like, She's telling me what to do, man. Like, I'm upset or whatever. Or, like, he's like... I'm... Like, I finally met my match. Or, like, something. Yeah. Because you kind of get a little bit of that where he's like, I don't know what you're talking about, like, Dr. Mm. Shepard or whatever. But you also got the kind of, like, moral side of him where, like, earlier, and he was like, your husband's not abusing you. Like, legally, we don't have to do anything. Like... Mm. Which is true. Yeah. And so, like, it's interesting because it's like, even though he can be a jerk, like, is he super, like, strict about ethics and that kind of stuff and uh, the way that or addison the, the way that addison justifies it in her head is our op- our only obligation is to her and her only you know and i mean you can see how addison justifies that but then alex is like if you start doing this stuff where you just find a way to justify unethical behavior then the whole system will break down you know which is so true and it's just like such a great question that i think the show is dealing with because you know alex is objectively right and he's Mm -hmm. powerless yeah because alex says like he's like it's one of the most bizarre complications in history or whatever so like would something like that even be like remotely possible see i don't know enough about medicine see i don't either and that's kind of because like there there are those like things where it's like yeah like one in a million chance of happening but like could it have happened? I, I should have researched this. I also kind of saw this scene where Addison is like, our only obligation is to her. As maybe a symbolic women taking back their agency from the Alex, Derricks, and Marks of this show. Hmm. I don't know. I mean, that's a possibility here. I mean, I feel like this show is a, a lot about agency and taking back your own agency. But yeah, I mean... Cool. So, Police and the Private by Metric is playing here, and we get a Mare and Dare scene. And They're so cute. They're, like, laughing at each other in the elevator. They're laughing and just enjoying being in each other's presence, and uh, you can't hate it. Like, you can't. It just makes you grin. As soon as you see it, you're just like, aw. So her laugh is adorable. Mm-hmm. I love her laugh. She's so cute. She's like, no, it's just, you know, bad sex isn't something that wives want announced to the dirty ex mistress. LOL. You're not the dirty ex mistress. LOL. You're her friend. LOL. (laughs) She's your friend. I'm your friend. We're all friends. But you didn't tell her. (laughs) No. (laughs) The vet asked me if we. And then he's like, what? Uh, What did he ask you? If we were together, uh huh, and I set him straight. Did she though? Because she just rambled on about knitting. Yes, <laughs> like in her head, she's like, "Set that son of a bitch straight." And then outside, like, Finn is like, "Um, what?" <laughs> like, because that whole like rambling thing was like, there was definitely like, there's something there. Like, it's just confusing because she was like, "Yeah, I'm knitting," and and he's married, and we have this dog and need stuff, and Finn's just like. What the hell is wrong with this woman? And Meredith is like, nailed it. (laughs) (laughs) So let's cut back to Miss Graber, Grabber. Whatever the hell her name is. We'll call her Graber, because Grabber's weird. Eugene (laughs) Foote. (laughs) And she- This. This scene is amazing. This scene might be the highlight of, like, George and Izzy season two for me. I love this scene. I want 
to preserve it for the rest of my life. So she goes, I'm not drinking another shot of espresso. I can't. And George is like, you can. You're the best attor- divorce attorney in Seattle. The best. You kick that espresso's ass. Kick it. Kick it. Kick, kick it. it. Yeah. Kick it. And then she's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> okay, good. So the caffeine's for seizures. What's the donuts for? And then Izzy goes, they are to absorb some of the coffee so it doesn't burn a hole through your stomach. Good. Good idea. And then they're just like eating donuts together. And I feel like Mrs. Graber. Yeah, I feel like Mrs. Graber is like the third intern in this oh scene. God. And I live for this. They're like all so cute. Like they're all smiling and happy and eating donuts. And then Derek just comes in and ruins this scene. And then Izzy stands up with like a donut shoved in her mouth. Like there's still like powdered all over her face. And she goes, we're making really good progress. And I threw my head back laughing at this. So funny. Catherine Heigl nailed it. Because Derek's face is just like, I hate interns. (laughs) Derek's face is like, I hate my life. I hate my life. Yeah. And oh my God. And we're making really good progress. (laughs) in your fucking face Derek oh so then we cut over to Denny and he's like oh this big moment but then it's totally also like the mommy tracking thing too which you're like just focus on Denny and you're like who cares yeah I mean but even the chief is charmed by Denny and (laughs) this is so important because everyone in this entire hospital likes Denny and is rooting for him which probably makes Alex feel even more alone (laughs) And mommy, mommy tracking. Let's cut back to Miss Graber, who's now playing a video game, and it's amazing. And screaming, die at it. Yeah, she's like, die, die. You only have 12 more levels before you reach prime seizure potential. What? (laughs) Also, like, this is all, like, theoretically the same day. Did they, like, can you imagine them, like, finding all these ideas and being like, all right, George, you go to the video store, video game store, and get this game. I'll go to the coffee shop and buy, like, 27 shots of espresso (laughs) and donuts. (laughs) How do they get all this coffee? You know, like. And then, and then, like, they, she walks into the donut store, and they're just like, hey, Izzy, you want some more? And she's just like, yeah, but this time it's not for me. Because you know that she would devour all those donuts by herself. Can you imagine, like, the barista, and Izzy's just like, yeah, can I have, like, 20 shots of espresso? And the barista's just like. And they were all in individual cups, too. Like, did they just brew all the... Like, I don't even know if they bought them. Maybe they didn't. Maybe they just, like, went to the cafeteria or something and got, like, a thing of, like, espresso. Yeah, like, maybe they made them. There's coffee pots all over the place. (laughs) Can you imagine if they had, like, this, like, coffee pot, like, smoking in the corner (laughs) as they're like, more, more espresso shots. And And everyone's just, like, going up to, like, Bailey being like... Your interns are insane. Like, and she's just like, tell me something I don't know. <laughs> like, I swear to God, those five interns are the maniacs in a normal hospital. Yeah. yeah. So then Izzy starts and she's like, yeah, this is fun, yeah? Like, fun that we had at home back when you used to tell me things? Like, where you live? Don't start that again. I'm not starting anything. I'm just saying there's fun to be had all the time with me, your best friend. It's not like we're in high school. George, don't do the whispering under your breath thing. If you've got something to say, say it. They're such a married couple already. It's so adorable. And he goes, last time you gave me that advice, it went really well. You're seriously pissed at me because of what happened between you and Meredith? No. Yeah. Which, like, seriously, George? You're blaming Izzy. That is the stretch of all stretches. Because let's be real. She was just like, you need to tell her what you're feeling, which is good advice. Like, if you're hung up on someone... You should just be honest with them and tell them. She didn't tell him. Be like, all right, George, you're going to go into her room and you're going to tell her what you're feeling. And then you guys are going to like start sleeping together. But then she's going to start crying in the middle of the sex because I told her to. And it's yeah. just going to end horribly and you're going to hate each other and not talk. And it's all going to be my fault because well, I play in this whole thing. Well, she is. He told George to tell Meredith to help him, not not because she wanted them to be together, not because she thought that they were going to make a great couple. I mean, she didn't know, but she told George to tell Meredith because he was... Obsessed. Well, no, he was in pain. You know what I mean? He was just miserable, and she wanted him to feel better. Yeah. She did it for him. Yeah, which, whatever. But I love how subtle this is, because Callie, last episode, throwing shade at Izzy for being a, quote, bad matchmaker, it comes back, and you're like... Oh, so George has been talking to Callie about this. Yeah. But and it's also, all like, of a sudden. in this scene, you totally get that he has still not accepted the fact that he had a part in the problem. Yes. First, he was really blaming Meredith, and now he's even blaming Izzy. And it's like, 
he needs to just accept the fact that like he is slightly to blame too. Mm-hmm. So I'm gonna let you take this next song because um, I don't want to say all that. Partita for violin solo number two in D minor, BMW 1004. I don't know why that took me a second to say that. Part one, Allemande by Johann Sebastian Bach. Cheers. So <laughs> is this? <laughs> so is this the like a cover of Bach that he recorded at the Hollywood Bowl, well, or so do like- the Grey's Anatomy writers just expect the audience to not be cultured enough to recognize that this is not an original piece? So Bach Bach is the composer, right? So he just wrote it. So a bunch yeah. of people, like if you Google this thing, there's going to be a ton of like people playing this piece, right? So they're not covers. It's just like someone else wrote it, but you're playing it. So that's a cover, kind of. But like they're not called covers. Like it's just like that's what all like orchestral music and stuff is. But does do, do you think Eugene Foot has any original pieces then? I have no idea. It doesn't say. He never actually, like, says. A lot of famous, like, violinists, some of them, like, write original pieces, but, like, a lot of the original, like, pieces and stuff with, like, orchestras and stuff are, like, old. Like, Bach is, Mm -hmm. you know, old. Yeah. And Christina's like, it's nice. And Burke is like, you uncultured child. It's It's not nice. It's brilliant. You uncultured twine. (laughs) Yeah, it's like, okay. So then we come back to the arguing. Yes. I told you to tell her how you feel. I did not tell you to jump in bed with her. And then, like, Mrs. Graber's just, like, looking back and forth between them, like, adultery. Like, she's, like, trying to figure out, like, 100% in her mind, she's like, these two are a married couple. What the hell happened in here? Like, yeah. they're gonna need a divorce lawyer. I'm gonna figure this these out. These two are banging. Like, yeah. Because she's like, adultery. Interesting. Mm-hmm. She's just like, yes. <laughs> Why did you send me in there? Was was it to humiliate me? It's no! Like, Whoa! What the like this line implies that Izzy pushed George into Meredith's door that night and what? <laughs> Can you imagine Izzy just like sitting out there being like, I wonder how it's going? And she's like, Ugh <laughs> <laughs> like, I can't unhear that. No, because she was with Alex that night, which barf. But she, she was, was probably like he was like, When should I tell her? And she was like, Oh, like Mary's probably in her room right now, like, George, you could go talk to her or something. Mm-hmm. Like, that's probably what happened, and George was like, You pushed me in there and you forced me to do all of this. I mean, if you knew she didn't love me, why? What what kind of friend does that? Ugh. And it's like, guys, remember this line. This will come back in a big way. And all I'll say is that George is looking for everyone to blame but himself. Izzy is an easy target because we tend to hurt the people we love the most. Mm-hmm. So then we have, like, a bunch of, like, quick cuts between scenes. For the sake of tension. Yes, yeah, so we get, like, Alex and the husband of Chris, the lady. Uh-huh. Um, then we get Bailey, Chief, Denny, that whole situation because, like, Denny's having issues, mm-hmm. Burke and surgery, and then Izzy and George fighting. And Eugene Foote is shredding his violin right now. <laughs> He's just like, no, 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 no. It, it reminds me of that one episode of Law and Order, Order Special Victims Unit, and if anyone has seen it, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the flute. The beatboxing flute violin matchup. It is astounding. Mm-hmm. You didn't want to hear it, which is just so true. Oh, thank you, Izzy. So many times. Like, if we go back and look at, like, our podcast and, like, watch previous episodes, so many people were like, George, it is not going to happen between you and Meredith. And he would not listen. He didn't want to hear it. And the only time that it actually sunk in is when Meredith literally said it. <laughs> literally started crying yeah. <laughs> to him. And then, and then Miss <laughs> Graver's just like, oh, some denial. I can work with that. <laughs> She is, like, loving... Like, she's like, yes. Yeah. You wanted to keep on loving her, George. You did not want to hear it. Which, so true. Oh, thank you, Izzy Stevens. And, like, you know how, like... This still isn't as satisfying as when Alex threatened to, um, you know, slam George's face into a locker, but it's so satisfying. Because it's like, thank you, Izzy. Thank you. When she was just like, I'm on George's side. Now it's like, wake up and smell the roses. Mm -hmm. When George turns on Izzy, Izzy's just like, wow, wait, maybe I was wrong about this. That's what's so uh, fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Oh my god, you knew the risks. You knew she was in love with someone else. Whoa. Which, whoa. So true. No, but it is so true and it's so obvious. But like, wow. You know what I mean? Because everyone knows it. Everyone knows it. Yes. 
that I just like that. I just like that they threw that line in there, you know? <laughs> because Meredith is in denial, too. And then, and then she says, finally, no, I'm not saying that what she did wasn't wrong. I'm just saying that you need to take a tiny piece of responsibility, which, yes. Izzy Stevens, I bow down to you. Thank God. And then Mrs. Graber starts seizing sin yeah. and ruins the moment. <laughs> and then Alex... This complication might be God's way of helping you put your seven kids through college. Which also, how the hell were you planning on putting your seven kids through college? I don't know. Yeah. And then he goes, what are you saying? I'm saying get a lawyer. And it's like, I can't really be mad at Alex for saying that. But I can't be mad at Addison. I love this show. I don't know how they Mm -hmm. do it over and over and over. It makes you not... It's like you cannot pick a side. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then... uh. Eugene dies, so, yeah, whatever. <laughs> right? It's like the violin, like, cuts out. They're like, time of death. Yeah, the violin plays his, like, his heart tone. Mm. So then, Meredith tries to talk to Denny, and he just, like, charms his way out of this. <laughs> and like, I, I, no, but I do appreciate this. No, this comes from nothing resembling a high horse. High horses want nothing to do with me. And I was just like, that is accurate. <laughs> also, Unless I'm riding the horse. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Also, there's been a lot of references of horses in the past few episodes. And there'll be one later in this episode. Right, there is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then um, Izzy goes, or uh, Meredith goes, there are strict rules about doctors dating patients. So the song Better Man by James Morrison starts playing here, and this will be one of my top songs from season two. It is beautiful. It's a good song. I love this song. Like, I feel like this song makes the end of this episode for me. That's why I love it. So can you just start from and for the last year? All right, so this is Jenny. And for the last year, I've had a lot of time to lay around in bed and think about my life. And the things that I remember best... Well, those are the things that I wasn't supposed to do, and I did them anyway. So the thing is, Meredith, life is too damn short to be following these rules. Which, like, he has a point. He totally charmed his way out of this, but, like... Meredith is charmed by him. Oh, yeah. Like, look at her. Like, she just smiles by him. And I was like, Aw. She's like, if you weren't dating my best friend, I would totally kiss you right now. <laughs> yeah, she'd be like, I'd bang you. <laughs> to be honest, DTF? High five? She's like, you're so much better than the vet. <laughs> Yeah, she's like, God damn it. <laughs> Stupid dandruff. <laughs> Hello, my name is Finn Dandruff. <laughs> so do you want to cut over to this uh, this speech about the chief where he finally kind of explains? Mm-hmm. He goes, you just came back from maternity leave and I'm not convinced you're back on your game. This is not a punishment or a reflection on how highly I value you. It's just the way it is. And I was like, that's valid. Like, it is. I think it's valid, and I like the professionalism that the chief yes. has. I think I think the part that gets Bailey is when he says, like, I'm not convinced you're back on your game. Like, I think he should have been like, I'm starting you back slowly because, you know, you were just on maternity leave or something like that. Because I feel like the way that he says, I'm not convinced you're back on your game, makes her start a qu- questioning her ability, mm-hmm. which we get later. And we see that so much later. Um, and so, like, like it is valid. Like, you know, you like when you, people come back from maternity leave, like, they usually go at things slowly mm-hmm. and all this stuff. But I really do... But Bailey's just not having any of it. I really appreciate the, this is not a punishment yeah. or a reflection on how highly I value you. Yes. It's just the way it is. Yes. That was, like, very well said. He does chief. that so well, but all Bailey hears is, you're questioning my ability. hmm Yeah. And it's like, Bailey, stop being so annoying. Um, so let's cut over to the vet's office, and I have a question. Does Finn ever wear any other color but dark green? No. Meredith and Finn are kind of, like, physically the male-female version of each other. So true. Don't you see that? Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like they could be, like, siblings. I know this. The way she says that, she's like, hey, and he's like, I thought you were knitting a sweater, which, like, thank God she stopped doing that, because her her sweaters were horrible. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I am, but I'm also dating you, if you still want to. I should have called, you know. I was going to call. And you're like, shut up, Meredith. And he's like, no, no, um, don't call. Never call. Always show up. And I was like, do not open (laughs) that Pandora's box. Because you know she'll just be like, hey, what's up? You told me not to call. And he's just like, 
<laughs> he like wakes up in the middle of the night and she's just like standing he's over. He's just his like bed. taking a dump somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> he told me not to call. What's that smell? It smells like shit. <laughs> yeah, it smells like shit. Get out of here. <laughs> Let us know if you get that reference. <laughs> and then I've got an errand to run. I run errands. And she's like, I run errands. She's just like, there is no way that you were getting out of my grasp. So then they go to birth a horse. <laughs> Meredith fucking Gray is birthing a horse. <laughs> I can die now and my life would be complete. <laughs> I also like how you had like, like you were saying like Denny a couple episodes is talking about how horses Do are like a good judge of character. <laughs> In his, like, smoker voice. Yeah. Like horses. And now the writers, I feel like, are trying to be like, Finn is a good guy. See? The horse likes him. He's birthing a horse. And you're like, he's birthing a horse with Meredith Grey. <laughs> Meredith is like, I'm bringing life into the world. And she's like, are you kidding? I want to birth a horse. And he's just like, oh my god, she's the one. But I was like, you're this like, is weird. And you're like, are we the only ones confused by this? And Meredith is like, let there be life. <laughs> I'm basically God now. I'm bringing life into the world. <laughs> She's birthing a horse, guys. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> All right, so now we cut over to Alice. <laughs> and she is about, like, if the chief hadn't interrupted her, I feel like this would have been, like, the longest speech. Like, just completely, like, bitch out, like, Alex. And just be like, Ugh, chief, I hate Alex. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's where this was going. It's almost like Addison wants to save Alex from himself. Mm-hmm. Because I feel like, and maybe this is too soon to mention this, but I feel like Addison is almost like, if I don't intervene, you will become Mark Sloan. Well, I feel like, because when they first introduced him, you kind of, you already got that hint of, like, that Alex really looked up to him. Mm-hmm. And you kind of already see, like, personality-wise, they have very similar, like, mm-hmm. kind of traits. And so I think you were supposed to start, like, getting that. And I don't, like, I think the reason that they chose to match him and Addison is to have that, like, he could be, like, he's, like, a version of, like, Mark Sloan. Or, like, Mm -hmm. kind of have that, to have that interaction, like, overtopping. Like, then you also have, like, Addison and Derek in this episode, too. And it's, like, all of that. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And I thought that this was so clever of a storyline because I feel like in the later season, uh, we're talking about Mrs. Graber now, but I feel like in the later seasons, it's always been more of a pattern. Like, you know, the doctor comes in, they, they figure out what's wrong with them, they take them into surgery, sometimes they live, sometimes they die. But with this, I feel like it's so unconventional when it comes to the patient because what they were able to realize in the early seasons was it's not about the patient. It's about what the patient does for the doctors. And Mrs. Graber like, fulfilled her purpose, oh yeah. so she didn't need to have a surgery. Well, that's, I feel like they also got in later episodes more about being like, this amazing surgery that we're about to do, or like mm-hmm. all of this stuff. And it's like, yes, it is cool when you have some of that stuff, but it's not... The show isn't run like is not moving forward and growing because of the surgeries they're doing. Well, what they fail to understand is that the audience doesn't give a shit about the surgeries. We don't know. You know what I mean? We don't care about a surgery. We're not doctors. What the audience cares about and what the audience latched onto from episode one was the doctors, the characters. How does the patient... How does this super cool surgery affect the doctors? And if you can't answer that question, then you've done something wrong. And I love this. But what she says is because Derek goes, you have to weigh those risks with the detrimental effect your seizure disorder has on your life. And she goes, unless my life is having a detrimental effect on my seizure disorder. Yeah, exactly. And that's so interesting. Because it can be applied to, to Addison and Derek. It can be applied to Izzy and George as well you know what i mean it can be applied on so Mm -hmm. many levels it's like what she says it's like with you and your wife is the bad sex your biggest problem or are all the bigger problems causing the bad sex it's kind of like it's true so fascinating and so well written because that is so that's so satisfying and honestly this patient was 
basically just playing games the whole the whole episode and it's one of the most satisfying patients which just proves that Mm -hmm. the audience really doesn't care about the surgery of it all Mm -hmm. you know well it's because while they were having fun she was bringing izzy and george kind of back together getting that relationship with them but then also bringing up this whole thing of like like are your problems causing something else or like or is like like what is really the cause of something Mm -hmm. you know I think that this is one of the best jobs of this entire show of having a patient parallel. And I feel like that's almost why I enjoyed her so much is because the parallels are phenomenal with this patient. Well, and because that whole thing I feel like can be applied to not only like the characters like that were directly involved with her, but in other things too. It's like is the chief mommy tracking her causing her to like not notice things or is like the chief kind of noticing that like her not noticing things is because that she's not mm-hmm. on top of her game? And thus, he's mommy tracking her. Yeah, it's it's just uh, it's all about like changing your life, standing up and making the decision to 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 do certain things. You know, mm-hmm. I just I very I very much like that. It's almost like a universal truth. It's almost like a universal life lesson that you get here, mm-hmm. and I appreciate it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, Meredith and Finn just birthed a horse. <laughs> um, wow, Can we and his jumpsuit that? is dark green, by the way. But they do have this little, like, the way that they look each o- at each other after this is cute. Like, they, they have some yes. nice chemistry. But the two you, actors. But you you kind of get the sense that, like, yeah, this vet guy's a really nice distraction, but you, Meredith would never end up with him. He's the help. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, she, she would outgrow him, well, get bored of him so easily. Well, and I think it's supposed to be... We get more scenes with the whole, because, like, you're supposed to kind of get the whole, like, be comparing... Finn and Derek. Constantly. And that whole thing. And it's like, yes, Finn is a nice guy, and, like, being with him, I feel like, would be easy mm-hmm. for Meredith, but she's not the type of girl that wants the easy. The well, like, what's easy and what's right are two different things. Exactly. And so it's, like, it's supposed to be, like, you can have other people that are, like, super nice and kind of, like, good for you, but they might not necessarily be, like, your person. And that will directly be referenced in a couple of episodes. Mm-hmm. And then, freaking rose of course her name is rose which like she's i'm so i'm sorry i told chris about the complication like why why the hell would you tell him that i mean first off we're like i'm about to destroy this woman first off i would have looked my husband straight in the face and been like i'm getting my tubes tied i don't want any more children suck it up like that's just me i've been popping out babies for you for years now first off i wouldn't even had seven children in the first place (laughs) after two i'd have been like sucks for you be like, get a vasectomy or I'm getting my twos. Yeah, like, like, son of a bitch. Whatever. And she's just like, I thought he should know that Joseph would be our last. Who cares? Of course you named him Joseph. <laughs> it's like, how is that name not taken yet? You know they named him after everybody so, in the Bible. So, They're like, so where's could, Jeremiah? So he could save it. I didn't know he was going to do this. You asshole. <laughs> like, shut up. Addison's like, I need you to tell him that you asked me to do this. So like, so I don't get in legal trouble. And she's like... No, I can't. You don't even have to pay. Yes, she does. Like, that's her career. Yeah. For me, it's my marriage. Stand up to your husband, woman. Get over yourself, Rose. I hate you. Like, don't make your doctor stand up for yourself. If like, you literally, st- if yeah. I was Addison right now, I would have been like, like, I don't even think this is possible, but I would have been like, bitch, you're going back into surgery. I'm untying your tubes. Like, that's not possible. <laughs> like, definitely not possible. But like, can you just imagine if Mary, like, Addison, like, walked in there and was like, I'm undoing this because you're a horrible yeah. person. <laughs> you're terrible at tennis. <laughs> because I hate you. <laughs> no, but then uh, Rose goes, you're the best. And I've noticed that in this episode, they said that so many times. Like, this is the unofficial theme of this episode. Like, like Burke has been, was like, somebody told Burke, it's like, you're the best. Everyone, Eugene foot dated. Yeah. And then he murdered him. <laughs> <laughs> Eugene's like, you're the best. And then Burke is like, watch this. <laughs> watch me kill you. <laughs> And then Rose is like, you're the best. Like, I feel like that is the unofficial And, like, right there, song. like, Rose is like, you're the best. And right there is when Addison just, like, picks up the scalpel and, like, stabs her to death. Yeah. We have this brief little moment of Burke just, like, super depressed in this on-call room. <laughs> and I love it. Like, it's such a simple scene. Mm-hmm. And it's such a simple way to, to finish an act out of the um, of the show and go to commercial. And it's, it's great. You know what I mean? He just, like, sits down and mopes in his little corner listening to Eugene Foote. On his, like, mega, like, 2000s boombox. He's just like, yes, take me there. 
And then we cut back over <laughs> to Finn and Mary. Is it coming off? Not exactly. She has horse <laughs> afterbirth all over her stilettos. Why did she? Why? Why is she wearing heels in the first place? Yeah, like that seems like not a Meredith thing Whatever. to do. Meredith is like, screw that. And he's like, I'm sorry. And she's like, it was a great date. And you're like, but was it? <laughs> like <laughs> you birthed. <a> horse. <laughs> Who was Meredith body snatched or something in this episode? Because this is not Meredith. <laughs> And then they have, like, this super awkward thing of, like, where he's like, come up, like, I'll cook for you. And she's like, what? Go up to your place? <laughs> no, but, okay, this is the highlight, I think, of the whole episode with Meredith, because I really do like this. Okay, so can we do this? Um, can you be Finn? The all right. All right. Well, here's the deal. Um, you have two options. You could come up to my place, take off all your clothes. <laughs> can you just read it? You could come up to my place, take off all your clothes, shower off the goo, ew, borrow one of my shirts, and I'll cook you dinner. That's door number one. Door number two, you go home. I think you ought to take door one, because, you know, it involves you naked in my apartment. But, you know, that's just me. I should point out that there's absolutely nothing you could say that would make me go upstairs with you. I'm kind of offended that you think that I would go upstairs with you, and you should know that I am celibate, so... Shut up. <laughs> Which, thank you. Ellen Pompeo was born to ramble Meredith. I absolutely cannot have <clears throat> sex with you. <laughs> if you choose door number one, I absolutely will not have sex with you. You won't. I promise I won't. I won't even try to kiss you. Why not? <laughs> I love that. She's like, why not? She's like, I'm offended by this. <laughs> Choose door number one. <laughs> All right. And I, it's it's hot though. It's you know what I mean? Scene. Like it's I like cute it. and it's kind of like mm. they have chemistry. Yeah. Yeah. And Ellen Pompeo could not have delivered that line in a more funny way because she's like, why not? And I, we get the sense that she chose door number one. So follow through by hotel light starts playing and we get a, our final scene with Mrs. Graber. Everyone say goodbye to her. I, I miss her so much. Anyway. I miss her so much. I miss her so much. I miss her so much. And then Devo. I miss her so much. <laughs> Bringing that back. Yeah, that was a deep And one. I love, she looks at, she's talking to George. And she goes, hey, George. Which I love that they're on first name basis. Yeah, I know, exactly. <laughs> like, she, I can totally see, be like, Where, you went out to coffee this morning, George? Yeah, I just saw Mrs. Graber again. <laughs> like, they like go on little like friend dates. Yes. I can totally see it. Right? I love it. I don't know much, but I do know fighting. And people who fight like you and Izzy, those people love each other. She misses her friend. Thank you, Mrs. Graber, because it's so, so obvious. You love her, George. Anyway. And then Addison is just like, I'm going to kill you. The, okay, but I the way this. that this is framed and shot in the, like, the, um... The blocking of this scene oh. is genius to me. Yes. I lo Alex is just standing there on those, like, open stairs, and Addison starts to go up the stairs, and he just, he, like, has his head tilted, and he's just, like, cocky AF, and I've never loved Alex more than in this And I scene. also like how they have her go to the step, like, one above him, mm -hmm. so she's, like, taller and than him. And you know him. that that's on purpose. Oh, yeah, because of what she, like... Because that's, like, he kind of says, like, the road to hell is paved with good intentions as she's, like, coming up. And then she, like, goes up and stops and, mm -hmm. like, says her line. And it's, like, there's such a, like, she's supposed to be on I love that. But it's so great because it's, like, you can't really tell who's winning ever oh, in yeah. their relationship. Like, Which they I always love. go back and forth. And it's, like, finally. Because Addison has not, has never met her match. And I don't think... Alex has ever met his match either. And, and I feel like such a weird, unpredictable person. And I also love how I feel like they totally hate each other, but I feel like they also like love this. Like, But they have mutual respect for each other. You know other. what I mean? Like, they're both like, oh my god, like, I hate you. I don't want to spend any more time with you. But they're also just like, I love fighting with you. Exactly. Like, it's so much fun. Like, there's totally that level there. Dr. Karev, you did such a good job today that I'm going to talk to Dr. Bailey and have you assigned to my service. What? For how long? <laughs> As long as I won, your ass is mine until I say otherwise. Congratulations. And we're all like, yes, we are here for this. Like, this matchup, like, at the beginning of the episode, like, I feel like it wouldn't be something that I would have predicted, but I love this. Mm -hmm. And it gets so much better as the episodes go on. See, that's one of those unpredictable, like, moments where you're like, wow, I never saw that coming, and I'm glad. And then we get, oh, Izzy and Denny scene, which, it's so weird to 
see him standing. <laughs> right? It's like, him standing up is just, like, very, like, not off-putting, but, like, very, like, almost surprising. You're like, whoa. <laughs> and then they hug, and it's, it's just so cute. It's adorbs. And Izzy just goes, you're tall. And he goes, I know. And I was like, this is so perfectly realistic. I have to wonder if it's ad-libbed. Mm-hmm. And then Bailey walks up and sees them hugging. And doesn't do anything. Again. Also, Katherine Heigl, that color looks amazing on you. They're so cute. I know. Ugh, and then we get another adorable Christina Little Burke scene. You know, Christina and Burke had a glorious scene in season one, episode eight, in an on-call room as well. And I I always like their, like, quiet moments to themselves, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, and it's such a simple moment. Exactly, and that's what I like. It's, like, such a simple, realistic moment. There's no weird drama going on. There's no, like, crazy circumstance. It's just, like, a very simple, humanistic moment. Mm Mm-hmm. There was an interview that Eugene gave. I saved it. I taped it to my bathroom mirror. He said he wasn't the most talented student at music school. But he said what he lacked in natural ability, he made up for in discipline. He practiced. All the time. All the time, he practiced. I wasn't like you. I wasn't the most talented student in school. I wasn't the brightest. But I was the best. You practiced. I practiced. So much chemistry. And, like, I really appreciate that, like, the, I wasn't the brightest, but I was the best. Yeah. You know? Because, like, I feel like, I feel like I can personally relate to that. Because I have very, like, strong will moments where I'm like, maybe I don't have the most natural talent at X, Y, or Z, but I will be the best that I possibly can. Mm-hmm. You know or what like, I mean? But, like, if anyone's going to work harder than me, like, there's no way. Like, I'm going to be the one that's yeah. out here, like... Yeah, exactly. Like, I may like, not be the best. Like, I may not have the most natural talent, but I'll be damned if anyone works harder than me. Yeah. Oh, here we go. This is by far the scene that we've all been waiting for. And I think, like, when you first watch it, when you see that, you're like, I recognize the vet's office. Oh. Because you see Derek, and you're like, oh, it's about to go down. <laughs> like, you know it is. It is. So basically, he walks in. With, like, with, like, almost, like, a dead Doc. Like, Doc is, like... Which it's huge, because, remember, Doc represents Mer- Meredith and Derek. Relationship. And Their relationship. Relationship, right? And as soon as you walk in, you're like, oh, my God, Doc is sick. And then Meredith walks down, and Derek sees her, and it's like, oh, shit. That's why Doc is, like, dead. <laughs> he looks like he just, like, pooped his pants, like, in utter rage. Like, his asshole is so tight right now. Like... <laughs> Like, he just looks like he just pooped like a diamond. That's what he looks like right And the now. way, like, Meredith is like, oh, like, is he sick again? And the way he just goes, yeah. Yeah. And, and you're like, oh, good God. I would like us all to flash back to season one, episode three of Grey's Anatomy, where Derek says this exact line to Meredith. I don't get jealous. And I told everyone that I would be bringing it up at the end of season two, episode 23. I'm bringing it up. <laughs> He literally, I don't get jealous. This is the definition of a jealous face. Like, this picture of Derek, his face, needs to go in, like, Merriam-Webster dictionary right next to the word jealous. Mm Mm-hmm. It looks like a mixture of hatred, like, self-loathing and, like, anger. Almost. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He is so jealous. So then, like, Izzy's, like, baking something in the kitchen. I think it was cookies. Or something. Because she's eating them. Yeah. Yeah. And then, like, George comes in, and he's like, George, hey! And then Callie walks in, like, right behind him, and she's like, ugh. <laughs> and, no, hang on. And then Callie walks in right, right behind him, and everyone's like, <laughs> and And she's like, oh, hi. Like that. <laughs> she's like, gross. And Callie's like, hey. And they're like, ugh, leave. And George is like, so we spent the night at uh, Callie's Callie sex, sex dungeon <laughs> last night. So we figured we'd just spend the night here. And then Izzy's like, so um, are you back for just for tonight? Like, it's so cute. She's like stumbling over her words because she's so like happy to see her BFF. Mm-hmm. You know, she's so happy to like be like, oh, I love you and you're back, you know? And George is like, well, Callie's here for the night, um, which... I can't wait for tomorrow morning. But <laughs> Callie should just leave after tonight and never come back. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, I don't know. It's my room, you know. I pay rent. Which also begs the question, he moved out. Why is he still paying rent? 
Because I really don't think as much time has passed as you think it is. Mm-hmm. Like, if I were to um, consult my timeline, which I unfortunately don't have with me right now, if I were to consult it, I don't think much time has passed. Like, not a lot. Like, maybe a... I don't want to... I don't want to guess. But then Izzy goes, welcome home. Yes, welcome home to the intern OTP house where Callie has never belonged and will never belong. <laughs> yeah, welcome her- home, George. And then Derek goes home to... And basically, like, has, like, revenge sex with Addison. And Addison, poor Addison has no idea why. <laughs> He's like, get in the shower. And she says, honey, it's a very small shower. I was like, did you not know what he was implying? Like, was he just like, let's save some water? <laughs> like, is that what, is that what you thought that he was saying? Like, Maybe they've done that before. <laughs> honey, we need to conserve water. <laughs> I haven't filled up the tank in the shit trailer for a while. Oh my god. <laughs> Only enough water for one shower. And then Addison, full circle moment from the beginning, she goes, thank you. And it's creepy. Yeah, it's creepy. The way she says it, she's just like, thank you. And you're like, ew. Yeah. You're and like, you get- were cute in the beginning when you said that, but like, <laughs> And all of the Meredith and Derek fans, like, their heart hurts at the end of this episode. Like, this is probably... Well, okay, I would say that this is probably one of the hardest episodes for a Meredith and Derek fan to watch, because you see Meredith kind of, like, enjoying her time with another man, but that jealousy, that jealous rage in Derek actually kind of gives me a little bit of hope. But, like, here's a hint, Derek. Throwing yourself at another woman won't erase the feelings you already have for Meredith. Also, George. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But it's like... Tremendous respect for Grey's Anatomy for exploring the complex nature of relationships. I mean, it's clear that Addison and Derek have this very deep connection and they have deep feelings for each other, but it's also clear that they're growing apart and that is not frowned upon by the show. The show is saying it's okay because not every relationship is supposed to last, even marriages, Mm -hmm. you know? They're saying like, it's okay to grow away from a person. It doesn't make you a bad person. And, you know, I have to wonder if that's... If they put Rose and Chris in this episode on purpose. Where Mm -hmm. it's like, maybe... You know what I mean? It's like, so frowned upon to get divorced in the Catholic Catholic faith. Mm Mm-hmm. But Grace is kind of being like, look how destructive that is. You know? And it's like, it's okay. If you grow apart from somebody and you fall in love with somebody else, that's normal and it's not the end of the world. So anyway, do you have anything to say? I don't think so. You kind of covered it all. So, closing speech. A wise man once said, you can have anything in life if you're willing to sacrifice everything else for it. What he meant is nothing comes without a price. So before... Before you go into battle, you better decide how much you're willing to lose. Too often, going after what feels good means letting go of what you know is right, and letting someone in means abandoning the walls you've spent a lifetime building. Of course, the toughest sacrifices are the ones we don't see coming. When we don't have time to come up with a strategy to pick sides, or to measure the potential loss, When that happens, when the battle chooses us and not the other way around, that's when the sacrifice can turn out to be more than we can bear. Seriously count one. Sadly. Patient rankings. Let's start with number four. We have the exact same. Wow. So my number four is Rose Ward. Because first off, horrible last name. (laughs) But like, let's- She married into that too. Like the only good thing this woman brought to this episode was bringing Addison and Alex together. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I don't know. I I enjoy seeing Addison have a storyline that, well, okay, that doesn't have to do with Derek, which I guess was Alex. Yes. Because she's so annoying and Addison should have punched her in the face. But I couldn't really think of a better patient for Alex and Addison to have as their first patient. Yeah, but still, the others are better. Okay. Number three, we both have Eugene Foote. And mostly because of the two scenes, Christina and Burke. Well, yeah, but that's how we always do patient rankings. Well, yeah. It's what does the patient do for the characters. Yeah. And I think that those two scenes were some of the strongest we've had between Burke and Christina, yeah. um, at least in a long time. Maybe not the whole show, but in a long time. And I honestly think if he had been more interesting in some of the scenes like that he was actually in, mm-hmm. it might have actually pushed him a little higher to two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because Denny was two. And it's like, like, Denny's great. 
And, like, obviously he brings so much to the show. Mm. But I almost feel like in this particular episode, like, I kind of liked what Eugene Foot brought with, like, Burke and Christina. Yeah. And so, like, maybe, like, I mean, and Denny just has the charm of, like... She, Denny, I feel like, would be a great salesman. Like, he could sell snow to an Eskimo. And then, number one, how could you not? Gwen Graber. <laughs> because, first off, she's... Like, she should be an intern. Like, she should go to medical school and come back and be an that intern. That would be amazing. Um, I want to see... I want. I might watch that episode of Private Practice just to see, like, if her character has any similarities. Mm-hmm. But she brings so much, not only to, like, the Izzy George thing that she has that, but then she also has a little bit with, like, the Derek Addison, mm-hmm. like, their relationship. And I just love her, like, whole thing of, like, is my seizure are my seizures affecting my life or is my life affecting my seizures? Yeah. Such a great line. Such an interesting such line. Such a great concept. Just great. Like how how could you top it? And um <laughs> make one change. I really don't have one. Um, Honestly, like, spoiler alert, I don't think from here to the end of this season I'm gonna have a make one change. I mean, I feel like there's Maybe like slight things, but like they do such a good job of like just pushing you to the end and getting mm-hmm. this done. That, like, nothing is going to be, like, a huge change for me. Well, there's a difference between... I was thinking about this earlier today, actually. There's a difference between, like, you could change it and it might make it better, but, like, I don't really care enough. Like, it, it's later in the seasons, in the later seasons, where I'm like, if you had changed that, it would have made a world of difference and here it's like nitpicky little things where it's like yes you could have changed that and it would have been slightly better but you don't need to you know what i mean yeah and that's like that's it's like do you need the change or do you that's want what i feel like like if i try to do a make one change from here until like the end of season two it's just gonna be like little nitpicky things yeah that's gonna be like this might have helped but like is it really, like, would it really do that much for the overall episode? Like, and a lot of times I've noticed a make one change often has to do with getting tired of one specific thing because you've seen it 10 yes. million times. But the first time through, it was flawless, you know? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Which, like, I guess, granted, like, something that we could mention for, like, a make one change would be, like, yeah, the mommy tracking thing gets a little annoying, but it's going somewhere. Yeah. And, and like, I'm, I'm, and yeah, we're annoyed with it now, but, like, where they go with it and what it becomes makes it worth it. Yeah. I agree with that. So there are some things that you would change on a rewatch, and then there's some things that you didn't see the first time around, and then the rewatch changes how you think. So, you know. Uh, next week, we're talking about Season 2, Episode 24. It's called Damage Case, and it's outstanding television. Anyway, written by Mimi Schmier. Yes. Oh my god, I love her. Like, she's a fantastic TV writer. Directed by Tony Goldwyn. And if you want to get in touch with us, you can on Twitter, at Grey's Uncut. Or, for me, it's at Hazard underscore Emily. For Becca, it's at Anderson underscore Becca. Our website is Grey's Anatomy Uncut dot home dot blog. You can get all the episodes there. And you can uh, leave a comment on a specific episode there. So that can kind of be cool. We do check those. Our email for longer questions or comments is Grey's Anatomy Uncut at gmail dot com. And please rate and review us on iTunes. That yeah. would be awesome. So, I don't really have anything else for this week. I don't think so. Just stay tuned. We're going to try to be a little bit better and more consistent about putting episodes out. Yeah. So, bear with us. We're sorry it's been such a long wait. Hope it was worth it. But, like, New Year's resolution, 21 days late, (laughs) is to be more consistent with this. So, we're working on it. We know you guys are listening and want more episodes. We're really trying, guys. Life is hard. Life is hard. And it's freezing outside, and so it's really hard to get out of bed. (laughs) Sure. Also, (laughs) my New Year's resolution is to not throw up again. Not throw up in a pot. (laughs) (laughs) That poor guy who rented us that place. (laughs) Anyway. If you want to share your goals for the new year, let us know. (laughs) Yes, please share your goals for the new year. We'd love to hear it. It's got to be better than not throwing up in a pot. (laughs) Although, didn't you do that this year already? Yeah, that was this year. I don't want to do it again. So you already failed. Damn it. (laughs) No, my my goal is to not do it again. Well, that's not a New Year's resolution because you already did it this year. Damn it, Emily. 2020, I'm coming for you. (laughs) 
All right, signing off. <laughs> Bye.